Good morning, everyone. So we're going to spend the next half hour talking about mainly some best practices when it comes to assessing your current budget process and preparing for your next budget. Um, as Christina said, I'm Krista Gardner. I am a partner in our York office. I split my time pretty much 50-50 between government and uh, nonprofits. And um, in addition to audits, I also uh, provide outsourced CFO services to governmental and nonprofit entities. And budgeting is one of those areas where it seems like I get involved quite a bit. Um, there are several municipalities that I am actively involved in their budget process year over year. And with that, I'll pass it over to Erin. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Krista said, I'm Erin Clark. I'm an audit manager based out of our Hagerstown office. And similarly to uh, Krista, I do split my time mostly between nonprofits and governments. And also, uh, as she mentioned, in addition to some audits, we I also perform some uh, accounting service work that does get very budget intensive. And I just came out of a, a budget season with a couple of my clients as well. So uh, this, this topic has certainly been top of mind and we're happy to be here with you this morning to, to talk about this. So to kind of just lay the groundwork for budgeting within your organizations, I wanted to just talk a few minutes about some basic financial policies. And my hope is that some of the list of things, if not all of these, are, are policies that your organizations already have. And you can see within the policies that we have listed here, the operating budget and the capital budget uh, should hopefully be project uh, policies that you currently have. And they're two real distinct policies as well. And as we will talk throughout a couple of these slides, I want to make sure that there is a distinction between your ongoing operating budget as well as the capital budget that will uh, fluctuate a little bit differently than, than your operational budget year after year. But really, governments should have these formalized accounting policies because they're imperative to the strategic financial management of your organizations. And the thing with policies is that they typically outlive their creators. So it's a way to really formalize and document intended processes and procedures in a way that will not die off when you have certain folks currently involved with organizations who will ultimately leave and, and then be replaced by, by successors. So um, with your operating and capital budgets, the real distinction and, and the the thing that you should really take away with these policies is that you want to make sure that you're not just satisfying a statutory definition of a budget. So many of your organizations, if not all, probably have some legal requirement to pass a budget each year. And that's a pretty loose requirement. But what we're going to talk about throughout this presentation is best practices to really achieve a more structurally balanced budget, which kind of takes it a step further. And so these, um, some of these best practices that we're going to talk about, if, if you do not take anything else away from this presentation, my hope that is that the one thing you do take away is that a balanced budget does not necessarily mean financially sustainable. And so oftentimes I will look at client budgets that will zero out, their revenues will equal their expenditures, but a true structurally balanced budget is one that supports financial sustainability for many years to come. And so I would ask each of you to start thinking about your budget, instead of having revenues equaling expenditures, think about recurring revenues equal recurring expenditures, because anything that is non-recurring, and we're gonna look at some examples here on the next few slides, but your non-recurring revenues are not a long-term sustainable option to support recurring operating expenses. So if we move on to the next slide, I have a few examples here to differentiate between recurring versus non-recurring. And I would just point out that there is a poll question that popped up. If you did not see that, you may wanna take a look. Um, so recurring revenues are going to be your items that recur year after year. Many examples for my municipality clients would be things like property taxes, water, sewer, and sanitation service charges, but these are your operating revenues that you know each year are going to be the primary source of your funding. Conversely, you have sometimes non-recurring revenues, which can be really, really great to have, but should not be relied upon year after year because they're not going to happen year after year. So certain 
non-recurring revenues that we see sometimes are things like insurance reimbursements and grants. Grants, I guess, technically sometimes could be recurring depending on the nature, but generally speaking, they should not be relied upon as a recurring revenue. Uh, some other ones that I've seen, albeit very less frequently, are um, inheritance revenues and legal settlements as well. So really just those one-off situations where they can be really beneficial to help balance a budget, but again, shouldn't be relied upon every year because you're not going to get those revenues year after year. And then there are some revenues that can be both recurring and non-recurring. And what I mean by that is that depending on the timing and the specific projects that your government is involved with, things like permits and connection charges. So for example, if you have a uh, development or some commercial expansion in your within your municipality, some of those might span multiple years. So maybe it's a recurring revenue source for two, three, or four years. But then once those projects are completed, there could be a period of time where you don't have those revenues, or maybe it's just, uh, you know, again, a, a smaller scale here and there type thing. So you have to really be able to differentiate between the recurring and non-recurring, because again, we want to really look at balancing that budget, not on total revenues, but on the ones that you're actually going to be able to rely on each year. So just like we have recurring and non-recurring revenues, we also have recurring and non-recurring expenditures. The most common examples of recurring expenditures that I would expect would be within all of your entities, obviously salaries and related payroll costs, that's most likely your biggest expenditure. Ongoing repairs and maintenance, and I'm differentiating that here between things that are just you know, your, your routine type transactions versus absolutely like one-time capital asset improvements or purchases, which you'll see down in the non-recurring section, uh, and then office and plant supply. So again, these are the expenses that you know year after year after year you're going to have. They're, they're going to fluctuate depending on the needs of your organization, but the actual nature of those costs are going to recur. Your non-recurring expenditures generally may not be included in your operating budget, Again, the capital asset purchases, you should really have this in a separate capital budget, or at the very least, if it is all, if you are budgeting capital within the same document as your operating budget, at least being able to segregate that separately from operating activities, because those, again, you might have capital asset purchases each year, but those individual types of purchases are going to change based on the infrastructure needs of your governments. And similarly, like we had an example that could be recurring and non-recurring revenue, we can also have recurring and non-recurring expenditures. And the one that I think many of you most likely are seeing right now is the ARPA funding. So what is unique about the ARPA funding is the revenue is a one-time non-recurring transaction. But when you really get into the process of, of determining what you're going to spend that money on. I've had conversations with some of my clients where we find out that because, for example, they want to use ARPA funds for water and sewer infrastructure, which is a perfectly eligible use of those funds, but then that begs the question of, of considering what level of expenditures are going to be to sustain that infrastructure in future years. So in some cases, you could make the argument that because of aging infrastructure, there was going to be some level of cost reduction. But I think in many cases, we are seeing just with inflation and the rising cost of goods and services across the board, that if you're going to be putting a lot of money into a large infrastructure project, you really should be planning ahead for an increase in the annual maintenance costs going forward. So what happens when that re non-recurring revenue, that, that one-time grant funding from ARPA, in this particular example, dries up, and now you have to build in recurring expenditures into your operating budget going forward? So those are just a couple of things that I want you all to think about as we are going through the presentation and, and really trying to hone in on not just balancing a budget, but making a financially su sustainable budget. So right along with being financially sustainable usually comes the discussion around reserves or a fund balance as a lot of times we're talking about it in the government world. 
when it comes to balance, balancing our budget or creating our budget or looking at the future. And so reserves are one of those things that we really wanna make sure that you as an organization have a good understanding of what your reserves currently look like, uh, what that fund balance looks like. And again, this can be um, multiple funds. So you might have to go through this practice or have this discussion for multiple funds and identify where do you want those reserves to be? Where do you want that fund balance to be for the future? So the first thing I always ask is, do you have a formal reserve policy? Um, it's often common practice in a lot of governmental entities to say we want three to six months of fund balance reserves, meaning average expenditures for that fund we've got on hand for you know, a rainy day in case of emergency, in case a pandemic happens or a state budget doesn't get uh, passed and our funding doesn't come through, we wanna have three to six months at all times on hand. So do you have a formal policy? If not, should you have a formal policy? And if you do, are you following that? Are you under that policy? Are you over that policy? Where that can really stem to kind of the conversation leading to is, okay, so if we don't have if we have not met that policy, how do we build into next year's operating budget a, I'll call it surplus, to be able to put into our reserves? Or are we at the opposite where, you know what, we have our reserve policy met, we have additional funds on hand, is this a time where we can invest in a future initiative that we've been talking about or put money, extra money into our capital project um, budget or plan, et cetera. So really that's gotta be, that um, kind of core of where you stand when it comes to your current fund balance or your reserves. And obviously fund balance and your reserves can be used to balance your budget. But again, as, as Aaron talked about, we need, to, we need to think about sustainability. So if year after year we are filling a gap where our revenues are less than our expenses, we're gonna keep eating into that fund balance. If there's no plan to, you know, uh, replenish those those funds, if there's no plan to bring in additional revenue re, uh, sources. So that's something that needs to be thought about. The other thing is then how do you show the use of reserves? And I have this conversation all the time where the end result of the budget that's being presented, um, whether it's to the board in a public meeting, et cetera, essentially shows the budget as being balanced. However, if you go up into the usually revenue section, there is a use of fund balance line item. So say in, in an example, we've, we've said, you know what, to balance the budget, we're going to use $100,000 of our current fund balance. That is not a balanced budget. And I really encourage everyone to be thinking about that as a reconciling item to how you fund your budget. So pulling that out and calling attention to it, maybe at the bottom of your budget as a reconciling item is better than having it up in with your other revenues. Because again, a lot of times people are kind of going through this, um, the financial information quickly, especially if it's not something that's exciting to them. Um, and so if they just look at the bottom line and say, oh, we've got a balanced budget, that, that's not really calling out the fact that we're using fund balance to balance that budget. And again, it's not helping to have those conversations as we go forward. So really understanding your reserves, your current fund balance is important. So now moving forward to some best practices on just assessing your current budget preparation process and preparing for your next budget preparation. So who should be involved in the process? This is really taking a look at your departments, really holding department heads accountable for the departments they're responsible for. Do they have access to be running reports throughout the year? If they cannot, are they being provided reports throughout the year so they can be assessing where things are to really, the goal is to learn for the future budget. Um, what's what's going right, what's going wrong, what's come up, encouraging people to be thinking about this throughout the year and not just at the end of the year when we're doing the budget. And that goes right along with timeline and expectations. So really making sure that there is formal communication over what the budget timeline should be, what um, what marks you've got to hit as far as depending on you know what what type of entity you are on approving your budget, advertising your budget, and then the expectations. What, what kind of information do you want departments to be putting together? Do you, are there phone quotes? Um, you know, do you have policies outside of state policies as far as bidding? Um, you know, do you want everyone kind of starting at zero, which if we go to the next part in building the budget is really something that we often encourage. Too many times I think we take last year's budget and we copy and paste and then make some edits. 
But the thought process really should be, okay, we start with zero and we build the budget based on what we need, based on what we know and based on what we've learned from the past. Um, and a lot of that comes into what are our key assumptions? So are, are there new positions? Are there changes in our services, our funding? Right along with what Aaron talked about, any changes in our reoccurring versus our non-reoccurring revenues and expenses, how is that gonna impact us? Are we expecting any tax rate changes? On the flip side, are we expecting any significant upticks in our tax assessed value? So those are always nice changes because that just means even if we don't have a tax rate change, our tax revenue is going to increase because now a new development went in or there's been some change in assessment values. If you're in Maryland and it's an automatic three year um, tax assessment change. Um, so those are the types of things to be thinking about as far as um, you know what's expected to change and also service fee. Do you have a three or five year service fee plan where it's already set out on water and sewer rate increases? Or is this something that you're thinking about yearly um, making sure that all of that is going to be factored into um, essentially coming up with, you know, those needs for the, for the future. And then the other thing is contingency items. And this kind of goes along with having a discussion on how conservative your entity likes to be when it comes to budgeting. I feel like a lot of times in conversations we talk about, oh, we're a very conservative entity. Um, we, we budget conservatively. But what does that really mean to you? And does everyone understand what that means? And the thing that I often like to talk about this is um, like emergency repairs. So Aaron brought that up that obviously if there are routine maintenance and repair items, we want to include those in the budget. But say something, you know, significant breaks, that's going to be a $25,000 repair that only usually happens once every three to five years, hopefully. Is that something that your organization is conservative and is putting in the budget in case it happens? Or do you look at that as, okay, it truly is an emergency, it's unbudgeted, we now go ahead and get the approval to um, go ahead and fix that. I often find there's a mix in between there of how entities are budgeting. And so that's an important conversation to be having on how you want to prepare for contingencies, for emergency items. Do you bake anything in for those or do you truly leave those as a, an emergency unbudgeted item and you deal with them when they come? And hopefully, rolling back to the reserve conversation is that's why we have reserves in place. You've got that fund balance on hand. So when these emergency items come up, even though they're unbudgeted, you've got a plan in place to take care of those. And honestly, one of the things, you know, we did talk about, we want to not just copy and paste, but understanding your past performance is relevant. That is important. But again, it's understanding what went wrong, what didn't go wrong, and how things are changing not necessarily just doing that copy and paste and saying, well, we were close enough last year. We're just gonna, we're just gonna use that again. It's really using that information to better the next year. How can we get better? How can we prepare? And then obviously the goal is to not just be thinking about next year, but thinking about the next three to five years. So Krista, thank you. That was a great segue into financial forecasting because this is another integral part of the budget process and it should really be performed really on a continuous basis. So financial forecasting is gonna include your past, present and your projected financial conditions. And to Krista's point, I too have seen a lot of clients that, are, that claim to be very conservative. And then I have clients that really just wanna have a financial forecast that is as accurate as possible. So I, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I do want everyone to understand that there are, are different schools of thought to Krista's point of, do you forecast conservatively and include some potential catastrophic items in there so that if and when those do happen, you've already factored them into the budget and then you don't have to worry about a budget shortfall? Or do you try to, to be as accurate as possible, which is also good, but that does then lead to the possibility that if you do have a catastrophic event, or a, an unbudgeted uh, large expense, then you would be potentially looking at a budget shortfall during the year. So when we're looking at those past conditions that we talk about, I used to think, and, and I would still hold that three to five years of historical analysis is, is generally a good starting point. However, as we saw coming out of the pandemic, when you have a period of a significant economic downturn, it makes a lot more sense to shorten that look back period because I don't know of any of my clients that would sit and say that the financial 
uh, impacts that they saw in fiscal year 2020 with even some carryover into 21 were concurrent with what normally their, their financials would look like uh, without a, a pandemic in there. So anytime you have any significant economic downturn like that, I would argue that shortening that look back period makes a lot of sense. But to Krista's point, you do want to use your own past performance as a starting point for making your doing your financial forecasting and, and for doing the budgeting. But you want to understand, as she said, why things might have gone differently. And so financial forecasting is going to include not just looking at, at the past and, and looking at where you think you're going to be in the future, but understanding things like demographic trends. What is changing within your municipality or within your school district that is going to have an impact on those revenues or that's going to have an impact on your expenditures? For my municipalities, I'll give you an example, um, one that I just worked with recently when we were going through their FY24 budget process. We were about through February of this past year, and I'm reviewing their financials, and I noticed that their water and sewer revenues were nowhere close to what their budget projections were for the year. And so I went and I, I, I said, quite frankly, it, I think you guys need to look at raising water and sewer rates next year. And of course, there's a lot of elected officials that, that ne don't necessarily want to jump into that. So they asked why. And I said, well, you didn't raise rates this year. And you projected an increase in revenues, which means you were operating on the assumption that usage was going to increase. Because if your rates stay the same, the only other driver of revenue, if there's no significant new development, is going to be usage. And what we were finding is that usage was actually going down. And so just shy of three quarters of the way through the year, we were projecting revenue to be substantially less than what they budgeted. And so going through that forecasting process allowed us to have the conversations to figure out what do we need to do maybe on the expense side, because we can't control usage and we're not going to change rates mid-year. So what can we do on the expense side to try to, again, work to balance that budget to offset the impacts of this forecasting that we've determined when our revenues aren't going to be where we thought they would be? And the financial forecasting really just helps then to guide decision making, and it really allows for that communication to, to make sure that both management and elected officials and the public understand the government's financial position. The other comment that I want to make, and this might be uh, a little bit unusual from what many of, of my clients are used to hearing because we do typically like to operate on conservative natures, but again, with a, a specific client that, that I was working with this year, we had a conversation with mayor and council where funds were budgeted and they were never spent. And then going into the FY24 budget, there's an additional large amount of money that's being budgeted to be spent. And the question arose, well, we haven't spent what we budgeted for this year, why not? So I'm gonna make the argument that if you are doing financial forecasting and you find that you're ahead of the game, Maybe your expenditures are less than what you budgeted for whatever reason. Maybe you've had some turnover and some positions haven't been filled or whatever the case may be. Or maybe tax assessments have gone up and your revenues have, have increased to more the, to, of what you thought they were going to be. If you have funds that were budgeted to be spent, don't be afraid to spend that money if you have the need for it. Um, I, I think sometimes we get a little hesitant of, of spending because we like to carry over those reserves. But I would argue that if you're doing this forecasting and you find that you are in a better position, it's it's okay. And honestly, it's it's probably a, a better decision to make to spend months that have already been budgeted rather than carrying them over on your budget year after year after year and not actually spending the money. I do see another poll question. So if everybody could just answer that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about salaries and wages, because as I mentioned, I suspect that for most, if not all of your organizations, this is likely your largest expense line item. And so this is probably an area where you should be spending a good amount of time on the expense side of your budget. So budgeting by positions, I want to talk about creation of new positions and dealing with vacancies, because many times I've seen budgets that because a government has set positions or they know they're going to add a new position, 
they budget for an entire year of that position. And maybe that's appropriate, but if there's a hiring lag, for example, if you're budgeting for, hopefully by now you've already completed a budget for FY24, but if you're a calendar year end and you're getting ready to work on your 2024 budget here over the next couple of months, and you know that you're going to either be adding a new position or maybe you're aware of a retirement, but there might be a lag between when that position is terminated versus when a new person comes on, make sure you're building that into your budget and don't just automatically factor in a full 12 months of expense. Um, again, same thing with your any type of seasonal or temporary employees. So, you know, if you have a government, I have a couple governments that have farmers markets. So maybe a, a market manager that's only going to work a few months out of the year, or maybe a municipality operates a pool. And so you're going to have seasonal employees to operate that pool, making sure that you have the, the proper uh, amount of time allocated into your budget based on the expected hours that are, are going to be work is really important. And it's also important to make sure you're distinguishing between employee, employees and independent contractors. So with employees, hopefully we all know that there are additional costs that come with having employees other than just their base compensation. So the related tax revenues and other employee benefits. On the flip side, if you are engaging independent contractors to perform some of these positions, you wouldn't wanna be factoring in any type of taxes or other items that, that would only be applicable to employees of the organization. I think it's important to also be able to differentiate between different types of pay adjustments. So a lot of times I'll talk with my clients, um, a lot of times the cost of living adjustment is kind of a, a built in, you know, two, 3%. The last year I've seen a couple that have gone higher just because of inflation rates. And in a few slides, we're going to talk about a couple of other inflation indices that will provide some different perspectives on how you can bake that into a budget if you're expecting to do a cost of living adjustment for inflation. But it's also important to budget properly for different increases regarding if you are if you have employees that are on a pay grade scale compared to merit increases. And I bring this up because I think historically there has been this idea of um, paying individuals and, and raising salaries based on longevity. And in the current labor market that we're in, I'm starting to see a switch to pay for performance. So where that merit base increase is being given more being considered more often than just stepping up to the next pay grade based on years of service, but being able to also align the budget with strategic planning and looking at, you know, what is your organization's optimal staffing level? So does it make sense that the, the current employees that you have, or do you really need to look at changing that employee mix and maybe pay two part-time employees for the salaries that one current employee is doing. Looking at all of these things are obviously gonna factor in, and these are considerations that you should have when you're going through the budget process. Similarly, one-time bonuses versus salary increases. Obviously, if it's a one-time bonus, that's financial implication that is gonna be likely non-recurring, maybe recurring, maybe it is built in that you do it every year. But on the flip side, those salary increases, when we go back to talking about recurring expenses versus non-recurring, if you're not doing a bonus and you're just increasing their salary, that obviously then is going to have to be baked in for budgets going forward, because as you increase that salary, you're likely not going to decrease it unless the individual has performance issues or is reducing the hours worked. So just making sure that you're incorporating the proper increases to employee uh, costs in your budget based on whatever benefits you're providing them. And then speaking of benefits, preparing for future increases, things like health insurance, 401k or other employee retirement plans. If the plan, if, if you're planning to increase salaries across the board for your employees, and maybe you have a certain percentage of their compensation that you're gonna contribute as the employer into a retirement plan, you better make sure that your budget is also compensating for those increases as well. And then lastly, uh, for those that operate with union contracts, it's just important to make sure that you are making, you're ensuring that things that might be embedded in those contracts are also properly accounted for in your budget. So things like overtime and shift differentials, um, I've seen sometimes like uniform allowances, any changes in those contracts, 
you want to make sure that you're baking those into your budget as well. Great. So the next couple of slides are just some things to be thinking about um, as you start to plan. So the first one is uh, really long term strategic goals. And we've touched on this a little bit in the past couple of slides, but really planning for the future. What are the things that you know have been discussed as possibilities? Um, are they new initiatives, new programs, changes in services? Think about, a, you know, about five years ago, stormwater was something new that a lot of us were starting to talk about and are still talking about how to fund um, those projects. So really, where, what are those things that you need to be thinking about, not just in the next year, but even in the next five to 10 years to be prepared? New funding sources, again, we've talked about the recurring versus one time. Um, but also planning for infrastructure sustainability. And this really goes across the board in if we get any kind of grant funding, um, the ARPA funding, are we using it for one-time projects? Are there going to be those related expenses that are gonna be recurring year over year outside the main project? How are we going to pay for them? How do they fit into our current operating budget? Um, and then obviously capital project needs. So we spent a lot of time really on operating here but a lot of you probably have that separate capital projects budget. Are you putting a certain amount into that capital projects fund each year? Is it based on um, yearly needs of specific items that need to be uh, purchased? Are you seeding any projects that are going to be happening? And this really comes back to getting those departments involved. It should be their responsibility for understanding what it is that they're going to need to be replacing equipment wise. Any big projects that are coming down through, are you responsible for you know, a fire department, firehouse that's maybe dilapidated and has to be uh, taken care of in the next couple of years or already needs to have been taken care of, um, you know, public works. Are there other departments that are maybe outgrowing um, their current spot that they're in that you need to be thinking about for the future? And also along with that, and, and I'll actually have Christina move to the next slide, comes with costs increased each year, as we all know. And, and I'm not gonna go through all the items on this slide, but as Aaron said, there are many inflationary indices out there that help us really come up with um, trends. Now we are in this spot of the, of the unknown when it comes to uh, costs, um, supply chain issues, but these are the, the areas that you can look to when whether you're thinking about COLA adjustments or you're also looking at, okay, we know a project's gonna happen in five years. We have an idea of what that cost is today here's what it might be in five years. And we've got to revisit that each year because obviously as this changes, we want to make sure that we're updating that information. But it's good to know that, hey, we need to be preparing for increases each, each year in order to fund, fund those projects. If we go to the next slide, then we're going to talk about um, you know, monitoring our budget. So we've got a budget. What do we do with it? And how do we move forward? Um, essentially learning from that budget and preparing for next year. So things to keep in mind, in the government world, uh, we're very cyclical. So timing of revenues and expenses. When our tax revenues are coming in, when our big expenses are coming, do you have sewer revenues coming in quarterly? Do you have um, some kind of significant operating revenue that's coming in monthly? So really having a true understanding of when your money is coming in and going out the door is gonna help with how and when, how often to be monitoring your budget. Also think about your basis of accounting. Obviously cash basis, um, cash receipts and cash disbursements versus the accrual basis of accounting when we're recording our revenues based on when they're earned and when we're liable for something um, is definitely going to be different. Also, if you do have debt, if your cash basis, a lot of times we're going to see those principal and interest payments as expenses, um, whereas if you're on the accrual basis, that's going to be a decrease of that principal balance on the balance sheet. So having that understanding of how your numbers work based on that basis of accounting and essentially running, you know, if you're running monthly reports, being able to match that back to how you budget. Are you budgeting on a cash basis or are you budgeting in um, true relation with your basis of accounting? Timeliness of review, I mean, it's hard to adjust six months down the road. So this is where it is important that the proper people are looking at your results often um, in order to be able to identify like, okay, what has gone wrong? Is there a major issue here? An example of this is utilities. Um, over the past two years, utility bills have just kind of gone up and gone up and gone up. And if we you know, wait till the end of the year to really take a look at and identify that, I think a lot of people would have been shocked that like, you know, hey, we, we doubled our budget when it came to our utility bills. So having a handle on that, making sure that we're reviewing things in a timely manner to try to shift things around as, as necessary. 
And then also when you're reviewing, depending on who you're reviewing with, understanding your audience. Not everyone needs the same level of detail or information. Everyone is going to look at something differently. So obviously if it's a department for department head for public works, that's all you need to really focus on. Um, they're not gonna be too worried about the details of other departments unless they're directly impacted. Um, but obviously your board is gonna want more of that high level understanding of what's going on in all of the departments. So essentially looking at current year budget to actual results as a tool for developing future budgets, it's all about what, we, what we're learning, um, what's going wrong, what's not going wrong. As Aaron said, there's a perfect example um, of needing a rate increase where the usage has gone down for um, you know, water or sewer and um, you know, making sure that we have a good understanding of you know, is, are there other funding sources that we can be finding or is this something that we truly need to adjust on our own in the sense of can we raise a rate to help cover um, increasing costs or do we need to look at we need to cut costs because there's really a ceiling or a threshold to what we can do on our end as far as increasing rates, whether it's tax rates or, um, or service rates. And then the use of restricted funds. So this is something I definitely encourage everyone to be thinking about, especially when you're having that fund balance conversation. So if you have a liquid fuels or a, a highway aid fund um, where you're getting funds from the state that need to be used for road work or related expenses, are you using that money before you're then dipping into the general fund? What other buckets of restricted money do you have? Is there maybe developer money for recreation? Is there stormwater money? that is restricted for those areas, making sure that you have a good understanding of this is what we have on hand to go towards those types of projects rather than just dipping into your general fund. So coming up with a plan as far as, again, those future cash flows and needs for even those restricted sources. And the last slide that we have here, and there is another poll question that just popped up there. Um, really, this is just to um, kind of caution you that it is okay to be comparing yourself to other governments. Obviously, in the state of Pennsylvania, particularly, we have a lot of governmental entities of various sizes, um, but making sure that when you yourself or you hear someone else in your organization comparing to another municipality, that there is an understanding that it might not be apples to apples. Having the understanding of what the different funds are, what the different operations are, the size of your governmental entity. I mean, there are big changes. You know, does one have a union contract and the other one doesn't? That it can be a very dangerous territory to get into when we just start comparing to others around us. That doesn't mean it's not a good tool to use, especially when you're maybe looking at salary adjustments, you know, seeing what others in, in um, like positions are being paid. But we just want to caution you to make sure that you understand what differences there may be um, and before going too far down and saying, well, they're, they're here and we're here, why is that? Um, so making sure there's a true understanding, but it's definitely a tool that can be used, but to just caution you on making sure that you are comparing to like um, departments or you know, other entities um, you know, in your surrounding area. So with that, I think we're out of time and we do have a slide here. If anyone has any questions, we can wait a moment to see. If not, um, please feel free to reach out to um, Aaron or myself if you have any particular budget questions. Um, and thank you for being here.